Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the July 16th, 2024 uh, meeting of the Lansing Charter Commission. The clerk, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Adam Simon. Present. Commissioner Anderson. Here. Commissioner Bauer. Here. Commissioner Boyd. Here. Commissioner Dowd. Here. Commissioner Jeffries. Here. Commissioner Lopez. I'll give you a second. Thank you. Commissioner Kawi. Present. Commissioner Washington. All members are present. There is a quorum. Vice Chair Simon. Yes, Chair Jeffries, I would like to call a point of privilege. What's your point of privilege? I would like to make a statement to the city of Lansing and my fellow commissioners. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners and the citizens of Lansing. I would like to address a social media conversation that I and a community member named Rebecca were involved in last week. Please note that I have never met or engaged in any conversation with her prior to this incident. Responding to an online article related to the Charter Commission's progress and areas of concern, a group of citizens who participate in a Facebook group were asked their thoughts on the article. Her hateful response directed only towards me was unwarranted, targeted, and rooted in anti-black racism and misogynoir. She stated that I was not qualified to offer DI recommendations for the charter, even though I have over 10 years of professional experience in this area and have DEI certifications from the American Hospital Association Health and Equity Institute and Northwestern University, currently serve and have served on various community DEI boards and committees, and I've worked on many DEI initiatives, initiatives throughout mid-Michigan. She also demanded that I provide my client list and proof that my consulting firm was not a shell company that I created to enhance my political presence and use to profit from the commission. Misogynoir is a term that describes the interaction of racism and sexism specifically targeting black women. In the workplace and politics, misogynoir can and has taken a profound mental health toll on black women. Her verbal assault and harassment were one of countless examples how black women are continuously targeted and thought of as less than or not qualified for their respective leadership roles. And it was a reminder of how I and other black women have had to defend ourselves when our integrity and credibility had been unfairly called into question. During this interaction, I was faced with the onslaught of microaggressions, outright falsehoods, and demands for irrelevant information. I asked her what she wanted from me. She responded, Lori Adam Simon, I'm waiting for you to do your expletive job, you lazy bum. And then later, what ex expletive clown you are. Her character assassination spanned over a week, 24 seven, to the point that she became so irrational and hostile, I referred to the state of her mental health. For her to target and defame me and repeatedly question the validity or negate my credentials was unacceptable to me. As a community member and an elected official, I take accountability for the unintended impact my words had upon our community. And I understand that my engagement with her was futile and unnecessary. Moving forward, any engagement I have with community members will remain professional, constructive, and focused on the critical work involved in the charter review process. Thank you. Public comment? Yeah, we'll next move on to public comment. Each person will have three minutes to speak, and I would remind you there is a second opportunity for public comment at the end of the meeting. First up, we have Julie Vandenboom. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Julie Vandenboom. I am from the First Ward. I want to call attention to Section 2-103.1 in the current Lansing City Charter, which reads as follows. Any person who has been convicted of either a violation of the election laws of this city, this state, or the United States of America, or a violation of a public trust, or any felony, shall not be eligible to hold any city office for a period of 20 years from the date of the conviction. I want to emphasize again that it reads, any felony. Compare this to what's required in Article 11, Section 8 of the Michigan State Constitution. A person is ineligible for an election or appointment to any state or local elective office of this state and ineligible to hold a position in public employment in this state that is policy making or that has discretionary authority over public assets if, within the immediately preceding 20 years, the person was convicted of a felony involving dishonesty, deceit, fraud, or a breach of the public trust and the conviction was related to the person's official capacity while the person was holding any elective office or position of employment in local, state, or federal government. 
I see no reason for Lansing's charter to contain language more restrictive than what's in the Michigan State Constitution. Barring an individual who has committed any felony within the past 20 years, rather than barring only those who meet the more limited criteria delineated in the Constitution, is just putting up another barrier for folks who are leaving incarceration. Our neighbors who are returning citizens already face discrimination trying to find employment, trying to find housing. Uh, let's not unnecessarily bar them from public service as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Owen Handy. Hi, uh, Owen Handy, First Ward. Um, I'm here to speak to you guys about uh, uh, how I'd like to see uh, city council uh, structured in the future. Um, right now we have uh, half the city council being elected uh, at large, uh, which means that the cost of running a, a competitive election is about $50,000 to $70,000. A ward, uh, a competitive uh, ward race, you're looking about fifteen to $20,000. Um, I would really like to see the, the influence of money in this city be restricted by going more to a ward system. It's a lot easier for somebody to walk and knock doors. You have somebody like Roberto Pena who walked, who knocked literally every single door in his uh, county commission race in order to win against a much better funded uh, incumbent. That sort of a that sort of an upset doesn't really happen when you when you have to when the bar to entry is fifty thousand dollars. You have to be able to fundraise uh, amongst people who have, can give you more than fifty or hundred dollars at a time, um, and that just and that shuts out a lot of people and a lot of people who happen to have uh, a good amount of experience and can bring a lot of uh, responsiveness to the table. You know, some of our best uh, council people right now when it comes to engaging with uh, the city, uh, with the public at large, uh, are our ward members, uh, uh, Mr. Cost, uh, Mr. Hussein. Uh, like, because I, I don't want to see our city selling out to, to special interests. I think it's really strange recently <clears throat> that we're selling the, try, or at least trying to sell the building that we're in for $2.8 million and buy a smaller building around the corner that's not as nicely located for $3 million? Like, is that, is, is that what the people want? Or is that what a developer wants? When we, re when we resurfaced Michigan Avenue, which has already been torn up again, like four years later, was that what the people of the city wanted or was that what Mr. Gillespie wanted when he opened up a new apartment building? So if we want people that, do that represent the, elect the, the people that, that live here, we need our, our representatives to be able to win elections with, with $15,000 instead of $50,000. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Loretta Stanaway. Okay, I've given this a lot of thought and I think I've developed what you might consider a blueprint for how you guys could go forward if it seems to you that this makes sense. The major issues seem to be, should we have an elected mayor, a city manager? Should we have fewer or more city council members? Should we have an appointed or elected city attorney? How do we go forward with those issues? So here's my thinking. We go to a city manager hired by the city council. This way we have a city manager who is on board with the same ideas and concepts and directions as the city council instead of working at opposite ends for opposite goals. And instead of a strong mayor, we have a what would amount to a deputy mayor who is essentially the city's cheerleader or, or figurehead who does the ribbon cuttings and the photo ops and, and takes care of all the PR stuff that uh, can consume the majority of the current mayor's time. 
So you've got a, a breakdown there of the hoorah stuff going to the deputy mayor or assistant mayor or whatever you wish to call them. The administrative duties of the city handled by a city manager who is certified as such by whatever groups do those things and somebody who is hired by the council so that you can all work in the same direction with the same goals instead of constant infighting. As far as the city attorney goes, as it sits now, the city attorney theoretically represents the mayor and the city council, diametrically opposed, unconscionable, impossible. You can't do both jobs and do them right. So what I suggest there is that the city council hires the city attorney assuming that because they represent the public that the city attorney that they hire would represent the public and the mayor is and the administrator um, are represented by the city legal department we have a whole department full of lawyers and we don't need to have one specifically set aside to only represent the mayor and or the council Let's give the council an attorney on behalf of the public. Let's give the mayor the legal department, the city administrator the legal department. Split those responsibilities, save the money that you're spending now. And then in speak, speaking of saving money, the next thing is city council. Five council members, four wards as they currently exist, so you don't go to the expense of redistricting, one at large, one's your tiebreaker, five council members, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Nicholas Zandi. So, we've. So my name is Nicholas Zandi, and I am a second ward resident and the president of the Old Everett Neighborhood Association. And I would like to speak on Article Two, which is the article you are on right now. It is probably one of the most important articles in the charter, and that is the elected officers. Uh, I want to make it clear where my opinion is, and you already know what my opinion is. Um, currently, it's four at large and four wards. That is a very inefficient way to represent the city of Lansing. It's because f half of it is at large, it gives too much power to certain parts of the city. Previously, the fourth ward had too much power, specifically the section around Moores with River Drive, where a lot of the bougie rich people live. And then suddenly the South Side sort of enacted its revenge, and now the second ward gets a lot of representation on city council. And so because of that, it is it leaves to one part of the city getting too much representation, leaving everything to be completely unbalanced. That's why the number of wards should be increased to either um, eight or nine. I think that both would be much better representative of the entire city than just going f four wards, four at large. And we're the only major city in Michigan, as far as I know, that does half at large. And no other city does it because Frankly, they think it's a pretty dumb idea to do half at large. And then there's the city of Detroit, which used to have all at large, but then they stopped doing that because it was giving too much representation to a certain part of the city. And right now we're in that same situation with half at large, so we should consider getting rid of the at large positions and increase the number of wards. And also for elected positions on the executive branch, um, I do think that, yes, we should continue having an elected mayor, but we can also do a city manager who does a lot of the day-to-day -day operations, kind of like how the deputy mayor, the deputy mayor, quote-unquote, is, but mostly instead of just being kind of a useless worker for this, for the mayor's office, it should be a separate position from the mayor. And also, the city attorney, um, it's currently, I think, appointed by the mayor, and because of that, it does whatever the mayor usually says. I think that we should do like how the county and the state does it and elect our city attorney, so that way our the people will have more of a say on who gets to represent the city more in legal battles, like how the state is and how the county is. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Linda Appling. Oh, 
Hello. For the record, my name is Linda Appling, and I am in the third ward, which also encompasses Eaton County, for those of you who don't know. My first point goes to when this city sells something or parts of the city of Lansing, any additional information or actions should include Eaton County. And one of the uh, primary examples of this is Potter Park. They sold Potter Park to Ingham County. And now we, who also invested a significant amount of our tax dollars into Potter Park, we have to pay extra in terms of parking or whatever else they do. We also have to pay a higher fee to get in. <clears throat> so that should definitely be in there. There should be a restriction in terms of the selling aspect of that. My next one goes to the fact that I definitely believe Lansing should have a council city manager type of government rather than mayor. Uh, this is similar to what East Lansing, Ann Arbor, and Grand Rapids have. All of them have that. And Grand Rapids has had a god, I think, since 1919 or something. So it is an effective part. My third issue goes to the Board of Water and Light. I am extremely concerned about the Board of Water and Light. Council must have the ability to control what the Board of Water and Light does. One of the worst examples of racism, and this is actual racism, occurred when the Board of Water and Light moved the gas mains from a predominantly white area in terms of popula and low density population to the Lansing area, which has a much higher density population and has a number of minorities in it, both Hispanic and black. I find that unacceptable, and I wish that a system could be put in to stop that to ensure that it never happens again in terms of that. OK, and I believe that the way to stop it is to give authority to the council to veto various acts of the Board of Water and Light. I also believe that when the Board of Water and Light issues bonds, 20% should be reserved for the residents of Lansing. We should be able to invest in our own equipment and what we own. I see no reason why we can't do that. The other part I'd like to explain is yes, I agree the city attorney should be an elected office rather than an appointed one. This would bring us in line with the state where the AG is elected. Having an appointed AG opens us up to what the mayor wants rather than Thank what you. the law is. Well, I would finish the rest of it, but apparently the buzzer went off. Next up, we have Michael Lynn. That might have been one of those times when you guys give her a little more time, because what I have to say isn't that important. So if you guys want to do that right now, I'll be glad to step aside. All right. So anyways, um, I could get up here and blow my top on all the things I've been talking about for the last five years about this process of Article 2, but I'm not going to, because you've all heard it before. You've all even heard it from some of the people up here. So what I am going to talk about is just what happened just now. Like the very first thing I said when I stood up here was just please try not to be oppressive in any way you can. I gave you guys a softball on how not to be in this very moment. I'm probably what the last speaker tonight in the beginning, you could have just given her an extra couple minutes. What that tells me is that no matter what I say up here at this podium, you guys are gonna do what you wanna do. So I'm just gonna give you guys a little history lesson and teaching lesson on how to be less oppressive and how to step out of your own way. Uh, Nicholas Zandi talked about Moore's River Drive and Ward 4 and how there's this the rich uh, bourgeois folk uh, make a lot of decisions for the city of Lansing. He ain't wrong, but that doesn't mean because you live over there you have to be uh, what he just said or you don't have to be oppressive. You absolutely can step out of your own way um, and see people for the issues they're talking about. So when we're talking about all these things in the charter, from my position, my perspective, 
Um, I was directly affected by some of the things that I've championed. But also, once I got involved from my own perspective, I started to watch what other people were going through. So that's how I became an advocate for others and not just myself, right? Um, that's how I started to figure out as I sat and listened to, uh, to, to what Boyd said last week or last time was like things that are irrelevant. When I sat and listened to irrelevant situations, my, my vision and the, the vision that God gave me to be able to see past my own nose, I was able to see their problem and where I might be able to affect change with it in the charter or wherever it is, which is why I championed the charter being open for four years. Because all of the issues that I found, I can go upstream and drag people out of the river all day, but if I can stop the person from throwing them in, which is the charter, then I could be much more effective. But if I can't see past my own nose and my own bank account, my own finances and my way of life, then how can I help those most marginalized? And that's who this is about. It's not about the businesses, it's not about corporations, it's not about any of that. This charter is really what governs how the government deals with its citizens and itself, right? So if we're not listening to the citizens genuinely, like as if I just said, give Linda a little more time, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have hurt anybody to do that. Um, and Commissioner Bauer, you were just about there. I seen you looking for approval. Could have just did it. And I think that's what we need to do. Be champions of this work. Be champions for the marginalized folks to step up here. Whatever that means, if you have to step outside of your own or what you're supposed to do because you live on Moore's River Drive, do it. Be a champion. I did. I lost my job being a champion. So I will. I'm good. God put me there. So I'm just asking you all to do the same. That's one-on-one -on -one advocacy. Thank you. Next is uh, Trisha Washburn. Good evening. I'm Trisha Washburn, Engagement Specialist with Nation Outside. I'm here to speak on Article 2, Section 103, Ineligibility for Office. In this article and in this section, it states any person who has been convicted of either a violation of the election laws of this city, this state, or the United States of America, or a violation of a public trust or any felony shall not be eligible to hold any city office for a period of 20 years from the date of the conviction. I just want to say that I have worked around people that have felonies that are younger than 20 years or lesser than 20 years. I have had clients and have known several people that have previous convictions less than 20 years ago. And every single one of them are individuals. And the, out of all of them that I've seen, many of them, if not all, have shown amazing integrity, honesty, and transparency. And we can't put a blanket on all people that have a felony without looking into the felony, looking into the case, and seeing the details of it and realizing that half the people in prisons and jails are wrongly convicted anyway, and that these people are people like us, and your chances of electing someone, putting someone in office, in any office, and having an issue happen of dishonesty or cheating, the chances are the same as when you elect somebody that does not have a felony. That that risk is what you take every day when you elect somebody, when you hire somebody. It's no bigger when you hire somebody that has been to prison. And studies show that, that crime is something people generally age out of and that most people don't end up reoffending. I am so surprised over the years working with people that have felony convictions and how good of people they turn out to be, that most all of them have turned out to be in less than the 20 years from the date of their felony. So I'm just asking you to reconsider this policy and look at, I understand felonies that have, that involve um, election fraud and things of the nature that, of, of the position, but all felonies, I, I ask you to really rethink that term, any felony and to give people a chance, look at the felony, and, and just consider 
the diversity of people with felonies, the diversity of felonies, and realize that it shouldn't be all felonies. Thank you. Thank you. The last blue sheet that I have is uh, Donald Dean. Don Dean, uh, I'm from the north side, the east side, whichever you want to take it. Um, so just to talk about a little bit about what she was talking about, I have a friend uh, that he has been uh, released from a job. I've known him for, since, for 20 years, 20 years, and he was convicted of a felony. I won't tell you which one, but uh, so, so he, he's been released from three different jobs that he's worked at for like eight years apiece. And um, because because someone else in the company did something, and uh, and he released, and he's having he has three children, and he's having trouble finding a job. So that kind of what she said kind of resonated with me, uh, or at least with him, it wasn't me. Um, but on to my second to my original topic um, is that uh, having having a. Um, I, I did some research uh, because I didn't just want to uh, take it for granted what, what anybody else said, but uh, a lot of research has gone into, into um, to having at large, at large elections and at large seats is it, really uh, can, can be racist. Um, Lan Lansing's kind of an exception on that part because we, have, we do have a diverse city council. However, the the other the other thing that people don't take into account is income level, and um, and lived experience. Okay, so so we have one one individual one individual I know that that has a different legend, different lived experience than the rest of the council, but what about monetary income? It takes a lot of money. To put on an election, and and it's it's very difficult for the average person, even if they're even if they're somewhat well to do, if they don't have big money backing them, it is really difficult for them to get on uh, to to them for them to be able to be elected to school board, city council, or any 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 elected position. And I think I think that that. And the cost of my point is, is that I think that ha having um, all uh, selected or um, ward, ward specific um, council people would be much better for that because then you have a more diverse group of people, not only from races, but from eco socionomic diversity as well. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I do have another blue sheet for from uh, Omar. Good evening. Um, you know, the biggest question is how do we create a government that's accountable and that's transparency? And no matter how you play with it, if let's say we said the city attorney position has to be, you have to be elected, right? What's stopping all the big developers and all the big donors from pouring money into that race? If you say the city attorney, not the city attorney, the city uh, manager has to be appointed by city council, what's stopping from all these big donors uh, pouring money into the city council races so that somebody that they like can be appointed, right? So no matter how you look at it, it's not gonna stop corruption, right? The best way to create more transparency, more accountability, is to empower the residents. And that means the board and commissions, right? We have more than two dozen city boards and commissions, and it says that their job is to help advise city leaders on key policy decisions that impact the quality, the quality of life in our community. How many of these um, recommendations that they make actually go into effect? How many of these recommendations actually get implemented None, zero, right? So the best way is to empower the community. The best, that's why the mayor says, you know what? When you look at the city uh, boards, let's get rid of the word officers, 
right? Why is that important? Who cares if it says officers or not? Because he knows that a community that's strong, where their members have the power to speak up and to say, hey, these are the things that's wrong in this community, and these are the changes that we are recommending, they have to be implemented. Those decisions have to be implemented. I just came from the uh, Board of Police uh, Commission's meeting. Once again, seven public complaints were filed against police officers. Two are closed, five are under investigation. Nobody knows who filed them, what the conclusion was, what happened. Was it a black person, a white person who filed it, a Hispanic person? Nobody knows. They have um, an investigator, a commission investigator, who's doing these investigations, but the public can't know. But it's the public that's being hurt. It's the public that's filing these grievances, but the public can't know. What does that say about these boards? Why should, we, why should they even exist if they don't have the power, if the public can't even know what's going on? So the best way to do this is to empower the residents, give more power to the residents, give power back to the residents. That's the best way. If you change the structure, whether it's appointed, whether it's run by city council, the mayor, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because they're going to find a way to corrupt the system. They're going to find a loophole. The residents should come first. You know, the city charter gets reopened every 12 years. So we won't see any other changes 12 years from now. Please take this serious. Give power back to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Erica Lynn. Hello, everyone. Um, Erica Lynn, lifelong Lansing resident. Um, so I could get really specific. There are a couple things that were said tonight that I absolutely are in support of um, and would absolutely advocate deeply for. Um, Julie and Tricia, you know, spoke very specific about some of the clauses as far as not being eligible, um, what Mike up uplifted about being, you know, less oppressive. Um, we'd prefer not oppressive at all, but sometimes less oppressive. Harm reduction is what we can get. Um, but I wanted to go just a little bit of a step further in the discussions because I know that you all are going to have actual discussions tonight about um, what's really an important section of the, the charter. So what I'm here to urge you to do is when you're having discussions about some of the very specific things that affect um, everyday people, uh, we, you know, we had folks talk about wards, um, the election of officers, term limits, things like that. I think it's really important to remember that we are, this is not a clean slate, wipe the slate clean and move forward situation. So I think that that has to always be uplifted and it has to be a part of every discussion that you have. It's gonna take a lot of courage to be the one that names that we have had problems and we have had issues that we can specifically point to over the last few decades of the last time that this charter was revised. So we have to resist the urge to just simply say, let's look at other communities and other cities that are comparable. Um, because while I don't advocate to not look at that, that can be helpful. What's more helpful is to look at what has happened in our community for the last 20-ish years. Um, the ways that it has affected our citizens, our community, um, the way that often decisions have been made in silos, um, and it all dates back to and goes back to the way that the charter is written and the way that decisions are made. So I always task you to to say, what is the end outcome? What is the result that I want to have? And if we keep saying it's equity, it's transparency, it's accountability, then there isn't a whole lot of discussion about what we could be doing, we should be doing, and opinions and thoughts and feelings. It's about what has happened. What are the negative ways that it has impacted our community, some of which we're still experiencing the effects of, some of which we will continue to feel the effects of for a very long time coming, and how do we ensure that those things do not happen again? And then we work backwards and find those low-hanging fruit. We triage and we prioritize the things in the charter and, and talk about those first because I don't want to run out of time talking about arbitrary things that we haven't even had issues with because some other community has. Look at what Lansing has an issue with, Lansing has problems with, start there. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak at this time? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the minutes, and I believe that Emery had uh, something they wanted to say. Yeah, just as a point of information, there is a new draft of minutes in your packet and in the packet that's online. It, the only thing that's changed is at the top, it has the attendance from um, last meeting. 
So when you're approving it, it might be different from the first draft you saw. It's just got everybody's um, name as attendance on there. Sorry. With that, uh, we have the minutes before us. Is there a motion for approval? Support. Our moves and Commissioner Dowd supports. <coughs> Commissioner Cowie supports it. Okay. <laughs> Are there any discussions on the minutes? Any changes, additions, deletions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, they are adopted or approved. All right, next we'll move on to officer reports, starting with the chair. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, we have uh, in your packet, you have a memo from uh, Emery to myself regarding uh, the discussion that we had last at our last meeting uh, concerning the virtual public participation option uh, to our meeting. Uh, the clerk's office has been working very diligently on this and has, has put together uh, that option and the memo that you have in front of you basically outlines what the process to utilize uh, or take uh, um, uh, a benefit of utilizing that option and how it's going to work. It's going to be very similar to what council does. Uh, instead of the four hour, I believe, um, period that you have to sign in uh, before the council meeting starts. Ours is just at 30 minutes. You can sign in uh, to take advantage of this option up to six o'clock uh, on our meeting nights. Uh, and then uh, from that one, from that half hour period from six to 6.30 uh, and prior to that, this is gonna give the opportunity of our folks to uh, work with those that have, have uh, registered to, to learn how the process works and how and when they will be called up during the meeting. We will not be able to see them uh, we will be able to hear their comments. Uh, they will be able to see us and, and hear our comments. Uh, but it's it's just trying to get everything in order uh, so it works. Uh, this will be somewhat fluid for the next couple of months. I'm sure we're going to have some hiccups. Um, but um, I think this gets us where uh, we wanted to go based on our discussion for a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's really no action here uh, as an item. It's just informational, but does anybody have any questions or comments? Councilmember Washington, or pardon me, Commissioner Washington. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I, I call you Councilman too. Um, I just want to say thank you to the city clerk's office. This was something that was very important to me because the public needs it and we want them to have every opportunity to speak. And some, I know how difficult it is for some folks to show up. And mm -hmm. if nobody ever uses it, that's fine. <laughs> At least we have it available. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, uh, I just have a couple of other quick updates. Um, with regards to our Facebook page, it's up and running. There is a link uh, that we have on our website to that. Uh, take, take a look at it. Um, tell us what you think. Uh, the community or the comment uh, submission form is also up. Uh, it's, there's a link. Um, both on our Facebook page and our website to that. Uh, I, again, take a look at that. I think it's, it was very well put together and it, it uh, mirrors what we talked about last year, or pardon me, last week, last meeting. Um, a reminder, we have our uh, legal counsel RFP interviews a week from tonight in this room starting at five o'clock. Uh, we've had contact with both firms. Uh, they will um, both be scheduled. Uh, we may not start right at 5 o'clock. There's a public service meeting, a uh, committee meeting of city council. Uh, we will start immediately after that, but it's, it looks like it probably end around 5 o'clock. If you have any questions, if you can get them to me, uh, say, by Thursday so we can go through, probably, you know, combine them. Uh, and um, we've also generated some questions from folks that we've reached out to uh, with regards to, like, the uh, Michigan Municipal League. Uh, and we want to put a set of questions together that um, we would present to both uh, parties to, for a response. It does, it's not going to mean that you can't ask any other questions, but certainly you might want to drill down on some of that. Uh, so we hopefully will have those questions to you by Friday uh, so you can prepare over the weekend. Uh, and then again, we'll meet back here uh, next Tuesday at 5 o'clock and start that process. Commissioner Boyd. Are we expected or are you thinking that we will select a firm that night after hearing those presentations or is that? I think plus? it's just up to what the body feels they, should, okay. they would do. Thank you. I mean, maybe there's someone that, or a firm that's really outstanding or maybe there's going to be a sense that we need to follow up with some other issues that may have come up. 
we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. And just for the, for the sake of everyone, what is the process? So if we choose one of those firms, we kind of know what that's all about. But if we decide not to go with one of those firms, then what will the process be? Uh, I believe I, this is the involvement that I've had in the past that uh, once the award is made uh, to a firm, the other firm will be notified um, that that was done. Right, but my point is if neither firm is chosen, then what? Then we start over. And we, you, would, we, you, would re, you would redo the bid process, you'd have yes. another, okay, yep. thank you. Any other questions? Okay, and then finally, um, uh, for our website, we still need photos and bios of individuals. I'm guilty of not turning mine in yet, uh, but if you want to uh, put that up. If you don't want to have a photo and bio, you don't need to have that. And if that's the case, please let us know, uh, and then the clerk can uh, finish off uh, that uh, piece of business that they have in their office. So that's all I have for my report. Thank you. Next, we are to the vice chair's report. No report. All right, thank you. And uh, for the clerk's report, I believe Emery is giving that report tonight. Yeah. Okay, um, just to echo the chair, the Lansing City Charter Commission Facebook page has been created and is public. Um, Commissioner Anderson has sent me some graphics to post on the Facebook, which are in line with the graphic that y'all approved for the postcard. Um, so feel free to like, share that page. It's up now. Um, second, there have been some updates to the Charter's website since we last met, including um, the publishing of the headshots and biographies I've received up to this point. There is also a link at the bottom um, in the resources list to subscribe subscribe to emails for commission updates. Um, this is something that the clerk's office does for city council as well. It essentially sends anybody who signs up um, the agendas and the meeting packets as that material becomes available. Um, so feel free to sign up or if you're looking for, if you know people who are looking for that information sent to their email, they can now sign up on our website. Um, and then lastly, the commission has received written comment to its email. These comments related to the action of the Charter Commission as of Monday morning are in this packet. And as comments are received through the comment submission form online, they will also be added to the packet in this section. Thank you, Emery. Uh, this will take us to unfinished business, community meetings plan. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, on, um, you have two uh, pieces of information under unfinished business in your packet. One uh, restates now what all of the meeting dates, times, and locations are uh, of our um, community meetings that we've set up. You'll notice that, uh, well, I'll just go through them. Uh, on Tuesday, August 20th uh, at 6.30 p.m. in the Alfreda Schmidt Southside Community Center, uh, we will be uh, working with Churchill Downs Neighborhood Association uh, and hosting a, a meeting there. On Wednesday, August 28th, also at 6.30 p.m. at the Let's Community Center, in partnership with the West Side Neighborhood Association, we'll have our meeting there as well. And then Tuesday, September 3rd, 6 p.m., Allen Neighborhood Center. This is in, in concert with the East Side Neighborhood Organization. Uh, and then finally, our one weekend uh, public uh, meeting will be Saturday, September 7th, uh, at 11 a.m. at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Lansing and that's in the second ward. Um, so uh, it, it, does anybody have any comments on those dates and times? Any concerns? For those, Commissioner Dowd. Not on the dates and times, I think that's great and thank you for the clerk's office for the help on that. I, my question to this is, is there a way or do we need to have a conversation now before we send out postcards of what the community should expect in these meetings or what sort of a, an outline of, of how we're going to gather information? Because as, as I feel right now, we're going to show up and, you know, we, we hope to gather. We've talked about meeting the community, right? But what is this forum going to look like? Do we, do we know? Uh, we can sit together or we can sit down and put together uh, something uh, to bring back to you folks to take a look at it. Uh, if you have any questions that you would want to pose, uh, to the community group uh, folks that come out. Uh, we can certainly put those up and you know that might spark some conversation or some thought process. Um, so give it some thought, whatever you um, come up with, let me know and uh, we'll put something together. Commissioner Boyd. I think Ben raises, or Commissioner Dowd raises a good point. 
And I might suggest that maybe this is a good opportunity for you as chair to have an op-ed in the City Pulse or the Lansing State Journal talking about kind of our first month or two that we've been in existence and the fact that we are having these community meetings and how they are very important and encouraging people to come out and then sort of laying the groundwork for what those meetings will look like. Okay. That might be a good way to do that. Good idea. And I think on top of an op-ed, perhaps, you know, some newspaper interviews or some TV interviews might be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. Other suggestions, ideas? Okay. So this kind of then goes to the second piece of information, which is the postcard uh, that we all reviewed and approved. You'll notice on the back side of the postcard or the second sheet, uh, it actually has all the dates and times and locations uh, for that. Uh, I want everyone to know that we have a very tight time frame to get this to the printer, and it's, that time frame is by tomorrow morning. Uh, so today is the last time we're going to be able to look at this. So if you have any questions or comments, Commissioner Boyd. I have just a couple, and they're very minor. Take them for what they are and take them or leave them. First of all, I think on the second, on, uh, I think on the second page it says visit or on one that I saw, it had, oh, at the bottom of the first page, it says visit LansingMI.gov forward slash blah, blah, blah. There should be a semicolon after visit. Got it. That's a technical thing. Secondly, yeah. uh, the, the headline that says get involved in Lansing's future, I believe very strongly that we should be asking a question and that rather that should be a secondary issue, get involved in Lansing's future, but I would rather see us have highlighted voice your thoughts on the city, city charter or something that ask them to take action on the city charter. So I think that's much, and, and plus I think if we're gonna get people's attention, I think getting involved in Lansing Suture is beautiful, but I think the key message is we want to see you at these meetings. Thirdly and finally, I would like to see each of the four addresses, four uh, locations have addresses added to them. Because I was like, where is the Unitarian Universal Church? Because I didn't know. And so I had to look it up. And I, so I think we should have addresses under those four boxes. Thank you very much. Sure. Other comments? Any particular language, uh, Commissioner Boyd, that you were looking for? I'm happy to work with staff and you on that after this meeting, but I, 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 I think we need I, to. Do I think it needs to be right, right now. <laughs> well, maybe we want to hear from you. Maybe that's what we say, or maybe we want to hear from you about the city charter. I think all the other language you have is great. So I just say. think that key message needs to be there because I think this could end up on people's desks or kitchen tables or countertops and they might not know what we're talking about. I think we'd be very direct. Commissioner Bauer and then Commissioner Cowley. Just to, the, the main, t you know, get involved in Lansing's future, but in, again, succinct, but use the word city charter so people know what, what they're going to be coming to do because we would hate to have someone not read it carefully and then come thinking it was some other kind of a forum. So I agree. Commissioner Cowie. Uh, just my clarification, when you're saying we want to hear from you, we have it down here. You just want to move to the top in kind of bold letters? Kind that, of? That's correct. My okay. feeling is that this postcard, as we say, it's expensive and we're going to do it one time. It needs to, it needs to hit our constituents directly. It needs to say, we want to hear from you. Or the city charter, we want, we want to know your thoughts on the city charter, or something to that effect. I think, again, I think all the other language is great. You know, it's a founding document that outlines we're reviewing the charter, you know, whatever. Vice Chair Simon. Yes, can I propose language that it's a get involved in the Lansing City Charter review process? That's being directed, telling them what they're getting involved in. I, I would strike the word involved. We want to hear their comments. We don't really want them to come, you know, we don't need them to be involved per se, 
because I think that invokes that we are asking, asking for a bigger time commitment than we are, and people are busy. But I would say we want to hear what your they voice. have to say about the charter. About the charter review process. Or give your input. All right. Just uh, Commissioner Washington. I just want to say something. Having done a million lit pieces in my lifetime, first of all, you don't want it to be too busy because people will look at it and just throw it in the trash. You want to catch them because from the front door to their trash can is about how long you have to catch their attention. So I don't think you want, you know, let us hear your comments on the city charter or anything. I think we want to hear from you first. And then, as um, Commissioner Boyd said, the Lansing Commission is reviewing our city charter. I don't think we need anything more than that because, frankly, this looks really busy to me, and I think we need to simplify it, but we absolutely have to put the addresses of where these meetings are. Okay. And, you know, I just, I just don't think you want to jump this up. It's got to be simple. I agree. So are we with we want to hear from you is that sufficient and that will go in the area that is red on the okay all right commissioner lopez uh yeah i think it should be less busy number one i, I agree with that and number two I, I think that we need to touch our communities that don't generally get involved and that means what are we going to do with folks a rich population Folks that have other language mm -hmm. in their home, um, their kids may 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 know the language, but the, the parents may not, and and we need their involvement. So, have you talked about uh, translations or anything like that, or have some information of the charter review in any other format for people? This to, not with this card. We've not. I'm sorry. Not with this card. I mean, this this was going out just as is. It'll not be translated into any other language. Is that what you're asking? Who, who will? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you very well. I'm sorry. Mr. I, I think he's asking at the meetings. You're having at the meetings, could we have uh, different translators there? Is that what you're asking for? Or are you asking no, for the I'm card? Asking that, have we thought about getting the message to those that that language is not their primary language? All right. Okay. That's the point. And how do we do it? Either we translate the document that's going to go to their homes, or we use other means to put that information out through media, through radio, through whatever. So the thought is, have we thought of anything like that? Okay. Commissioner Boyd. I, I would follow up your question with a question, because it's not something that I'm familiar with. You may be because of your heritage. And so I would say to you, how does your community reach people in the community to share information or to get information? Because you are probably the best person to tell us, because I don't know. I'll be candid. You know, my community is very diverse as well. So the, the community that I know may be smaller than a total community, Spanish-speaking community. And, and that goes the same thing for the refugee population. Mm -hmm. We have all kinds of languages within that population as well those populations. So the question is, are we going to attempt to do something? I can tell you things that may work. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that there's any number of community newspapers, community uh, radio programs, um, Facebook pages, or whatever. I just want us to make sure that, that we do address that mm -hmm. and that we make some efforts, and not only efforts, but that we do something to get this message out to them. And, and I tell you what, uh, along with receiving something in the mail that I may be or may not be interested in, I'm, I'm just probably going to throw it away, okay? Um, I think there's, there needs to be more information out there about the Charter Commission, what we're doing. And I like the fact that you asked the chair to do some OPETs and something like that and have some uh, press conferences or something like that because... There are a lot of people that are, there are people that are very invested in this, but there's many more that are not. Mm -hmm. And we want to get those that are not to get somewhat mm -hmm. invested in what's going on in their city. So I think we just need to keep pounding the drum about the charter and the changes that may be possible and 
you know, we need your opinion. Point taken. Mr. Cowie. Uh, my a question, is it possible for us to do the uh, different translations on the website? So we do the mailing in English, but have different translations with the same information on the website itself. We can certainly check that out. <clears throat> Correct. Commissioner Dowd. I've got one other suggestion. Um, for accessibility, we've talked about this, but making sure we're not just here and this is our, our way to do that. I wonder if there's an opportunity to work with CATA to ensure that we've got folks that may not have a means to take transportation to this meeting. I feel like we should have some sort of a, a whatever that looks like, passes, tokens, um, or, or we work with Canada to have free transportation during those times to get folks to these meetings. But I don't think, I think we should think about how to eliminate all barriers that could potentially prevent folks from showing up. Okay. Getting back to the issue at hand specifically for tonight is this postcard. Um, so we've got two changes. We're going to get rid of get involved in Lansing future, substitute it with we want to hear from you. And then, uh, oh, the semicolon uh, under visit on the first part, and then inserting the address of all the locations on the second page. Uh, is that, does everybody understand that, Commis Commissioner Cowie? Oh, one more uh, slight thing to put on the second page. Uh, if we could put on the bottom maybe to say sentence saying, all communities are welcome to all meetings. So it's not just for the, the west side, east side, what have you. So anyone from any community can attend any meeting. Good idea. We can, we can do that. Okay, with those, I guess it would be motion. Commissioner Anderson. Sorry, I just have one more change. Just to alleviate some of the wording, um, the sentence that reads, the Lansing Charter Commission is reviewing our city's charter, maybe reviewing the text after the comma, the document that outlines how our local government works, since that's explained underneath it, just to remove some additional, like, yeah, yeah. So, you know. So everything language. after the comma? Yeah. After the comma, mm -hmm. So the document that outlines how our local government works is out. Is that what you're proposing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And also, Emory, if you want me to make any of these like changes, let me know. <laughs> okay, so a motion is going to. Oh. I, I just want to say that I, I misspoke. It should be a colon, not a semicolon. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, geez. Do I dare say anything more here? Um, so, with those changes. I'd like to make a motion to adopt with the changes. Thank you. Um, it's been moved and supported, moved by Commissioner Cowie, supported by, <clears throat> excuse me, Commissioner Washington. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It passes. We will not see this again. <laughs> All right. This brings us to new business, Article 2. Okay, everybody should have uh, in their packet a uh, copy of Article 2. It contains uh, four chapters and 27 sections uh, and subsections. So uh, as, as we've done uh, in the prior meeting, uh, we'll go through this uh, section by section just to review that. The focus is to try to uh, identify areas of concern uh, that uh, anyone may have uh, and to hopefully educate ourselves and the public as to what's in the charter. Uh, with eventually circling back probably sometime around mid-October to actually go through the charter uh, line by line to make uh, specific revisions that we feel are necessary. Um, so going through that, um, uh, the first chapter is just entitled Officers. Uh, it goes and it defines what elective officers are. Uh, it's the mayor, eight members of city council, and the city clerk. Uh, each uh, officer will have a term of four years, talks about the term, um, and it talks about the staggered terms of uh, both the at-large and ward uh, council members. Uh, in 2102, talks about the qualifications uh, for uh, office, for elective office. You have to be a registered voter in the city of Lansing, uh, have been a resident in the city for one year prior to taking office. So. Even if you didn't live there for that entire year, you could be running for less uh, during the period of time that will chew up that year. So uh, a ward council member has to be uh, a, 
resident of the ward that they he or she will represent. Does anybody have any questions or any concerns with those um, sections? Commissioner Boyd. I'm not quite sure what you want from us. If you want us to comment on what is in that section. Sure. You can comment. Um, I, I will say from my perspective, I, I've heard from people tonight about the felony restrictions. I, that is something I definitely want to look at. I think at a minimum, the city should be following what the state is doing. I think 20 years is a lot and too much. Um, I'm, I have major questions about the makeup of the council, whether it's eight people or seven people or nine people. I'm just saying that going down in the future, those are things I'm going to be looking at. Okay. As we go through this, if, if in terms of the comments, if we want to keep them uh, to the sub or to the section that we're dealing with, uh, for example, with the uh, next uh, section, section 103, ineligibility for office, that comes in the 20 years. Okay. Um, issue that uh, everybody has raised is found in, in that section. Um, it also talks about no person who is in default to the city uh, can run or is ineligible for office. And, and a person who is um, held in any elective office shall not be eligible for appointment to a non-elective office or employment for compensation uh, uh, by any agency of the city for a period of one year after their, their term has expired. Uh, so I, I uh, you know, we can highlight the uh, 103.1, which talks about the 20 years data conviction. I do want to talk about uh, point two uh, later on when we get into the uh, defining who is in default of the city. Uh, there were a number of issues when I was on council that uh, that issue came up. Uh, council, or Commissioner Washington. Um, Chairman Jeffries, I just want to be very clear that I have a lot of suggestions for this article too and my silence does not mean I don't have suggestions I'm going to be waiting until we actually so get into the the I'm niche sure. of it so I don't want my silence during these procedures of simple review mm -hmm. to be misconstrued as I have nothing to say because you know me I have plenty to say <laughs> thank, <I don't> you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you understood Mr. Bauer and I'm, I'm sure I speak for all of us up here from everything we have heard and we'll hear a great deal more but we know that this section is probably one that has immense uh, opinions interest so I agree with Commissioner Washington you know it's in, I think we all all um, mm -hmm. are on that same page that we are very well aware that the people of our city uh, are really taking a, and they're all over the map when it comes to opinions on this structure well and I, I think you know we also discussed the, the point that you know we need to hear from the people first and before we start really getting into the meat of things and this is an opportunity to hear from them but also to to begin that review process so it's well understood so anyone else have any questions or comments on two point or two dash 103 <laughs> Commissioner I guess I'm just like uh, Commissioner Washington that there's a lot to say about this action, but if we're not going to act on anything, I guess it's just for the community to know what's in the charter. Is that what it mm -hmm. is? Well, and it, you know, you can express opinions and comments. Yeah. Okay, fine. I mean, it's, on, it's all on the table. Okay, um, officers, uh, 2.104 compensation of officers. Just talks about, this is the, the part of the charter that talks about the Compensation Commission, talks about how by ordinance the compensation procedure uh, will be developed for the city. So that's something that um, definitely the city council would have a say in. Uh, and it's, it's basically saying that the city may by ordinance at any time alter its procedure for determining compensation uh, for any of the uh, officers or employees. The next section is bonds of officers. So this is basically the insurance where um, uh, there will be surety bonds or public officer bonds that um, may be required by certain officers and employees that of the city that uh, are responsible for city funds. So if um, there was a, a failure um, uh, or some criminal activity by the person that had that responsibility, that bond would be in place to cover the city for any loss uh, or liability. 
Um, 2.106, the oath of office. Uh, we've all done that, so we know what that's about. Um, uh, election of officers, 2.2-201, uh, uh, time of elections. Um, based, very straightforward, uh, we'll, be, uh, pro we'll be following state law on that. Uh, basically, we're all nonpartisan. It's a nonpartisan ballot. We're not, uh, there'll be no political designation on the ballots. Um, chapter 2, 2-203, uh, two it's a big one, wards. This is the one that um, basically establishes the city that uh, there will be four wards. Um, it, it goes on to define how the ward will be, um, the boundaries of the ward, um, and how the election commission shall review those boundaries uh, after um, the federal census. And um, uh, it will be up to the election commission to do that, to establish those wards. Um, the election of officers, uh, 2.204 method of nomination. Uh, this is uh, basically sets forth how a person is supposed to uh, run for office in the city of East Lansing. You can either do it by a petition or by filing a uh, filing fee, submitting a filing fee. Uh, the filing fee, I believe, uh, was set at $100. Um, but it also talks about the nominating petitions for ward members uh, shall contain at least 100 to 150, but no more than 150 names on that petition. And for the at-large positions, uh, no less than 400, no more than 600 uh, names on the petition. Commissioner Anderson. Um, when I was reading through the charter, this came up to me because I just, I guess I don't understand why there's a limit as to how many signatures people get. It seems like it's an unnecessary barrier of people to make sure they don't go over that amount. Yeah. I don't know. I That's just. That's a good question. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, I, we have an answer. Here we go. Yeah. Um, when we deal with these petitions in the clerk's office, we do actually go through and validate every single one of these signatures. So if someone comes in with like 20,000 signatures, that's going to throw our office into a fit. So I'm assuming that it has something to do with that. So if they have 151, what, like what is, you know, it is, does it not matter? Or I just want to lose the signature. I mean, it probably, yeah, it'd be fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> you just, no, we want to operate within the rules. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to give us 151. It, and this is an area that I would suggest we think about and come back and look at. I had the exact same question. This was so many years ago. Do we need to look at the numbers, the minimum numbers, and um, the maximum numbers? So that's what I would, that would be one I think we need to. Commissioner Boyd. And I also think when we're having that conversation, we also need to look at the filing fee. How, you know, $100, maybe that's a good fee, I don't know. It, how does it compare to the state? You know what the state asks. It, it's been there for, again, 40 years, mm -hmm. as long as we've had our sure. charter, so we should add that to the list of things to talk about. Commissioner Lopez. Yeah, as far as um, this would be, if, if we choose to change from from at large wards to at large, uh, you know, seats to to seven wards, let's say. So the number's going to change. So we would have to see the census and see each track, and then make a decision as to percentage-wise how many signatures should we have, mm -hmm. uh, or make some sort of determination that way. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, for let's say if we continue with the mayor, it's, that's a different story. But as far as wards are concerned. And that's where also the cost comes into for candidates. Mm -hmm. That uh, so we, we need to wait on this one, but certainly it's a concern that, that we need to have some sort of system uh, or set some sort of system to um, identify percentage of signatures could be a hundred, could be two hundred. I don't know. And, and then of course look at uh, if we're just going to pay the fee okay. for that. Commissioner Andrews. Um, I guess just to piggyback off of, like, if we do create more wards, um, I mean, there's 115 to 116,000 residents in Lansing. So from my understanding, I think the wards are divided by the existing populace. And so 
Yeah. So from my math, currently with four wards, each ward is representing like 28,000 people. So if we went to like seven, it would be like 16,500. And so I don't know if we would need to look at like the census tracts or not and just assume that the wards would be as even as possible, I guess. I don't know. Commissioner Washington. I just have a quick comment. Maybe we do away with the petitions altogether, lower the filing fee, whatever. When I filed my petitions the first time I ran, Chris Swope almost had a heart attack. He said, nobody does this. And, and it is burdensome. It's incredibly burdensome. So, I mean, we can look at different things, but I am also just really going to quick ask this, uh, Chairman Jeffries, when we get to really doing the meat of the discussion on the wards, I would like to request that and I will remind you later that I think it's Sam Kwan that does it, that we get a printout, an actual printout of what seven wards would look like throughout the city and nine wards so that we can make an educated decision if we decide to go to those wards. Because we all know it's very unfair to have your ward rep live in Moores River, Gri Moores River Drive and you might live in Hildebrandt. You know, so I, I would like to see what those seven wards would look like in the nine wards. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on to the next, uh, the uh, 2 205, the Election Commission. Again, this just sets forth who's on the Election Commission uh, and uh, how they will operate. Uh, fairly straightforward. Um, the, as we get into vacancies, 2-301, absence from office, uh, they're talking about this deals with elective officers that have failed to perform their duties uh, of the office for 60 consecutive days or more. Basically puts forth a forfeiture um, uh, provision that if uh, there's an inability or if, if the person has not performed duties for over 60 consecutive days and the city council does not excuse the inability uh, to appear after that 60 days has lapsed, the, that person's office is automatically forfeited. And then that will run into uh, 2-302, forfeiture and removal for cause. Um, so if there is a forfeiture, um, it talks about uh, how that process is going to work, what the authority, it provides the authority for forfeiture. Uh, and it also sets forth um, uh, what the four cause provisions would be uh, if you were to remove someone from office. It talks about lack at any time, any qualifications required by the charter, convicted of a felony while holding the office or appointment, violates a provision of this charter, punishable by forfeiture. Um, so it also has a provision in here that any resident of the city may petition an appropriate court to require the city council to hold a public hearing on the forfeiture of an office if the city council has unreasonably refused to proceed. So that puts that power back into the people. Uh, and then the next section deals with fillings of vacant, the filling of vacancies. Um, the, uh, uh, it talks about the timelines the council and the mayor have to meet in order to do that uh, and who if the, if the uh, mayor leaves office like when uh, Mayor Hollister left uh, the president of city council uh, had the opportunity to uh, become mayor uh, Tony Benavides did that that was the process that was followed and it's outlined here um, and um, so uh, that basically is pretty straightforward. Does anybody have any questions on that or any concerns? Okay, under temporary absence of mayor, uh, this has been an issue when, when we were on council. I see Joan is nodding her head. Um, when the, when the, the, the mayor is absent, temporarily absent from the city, uh, under the charter, the president of city council uh, shall be considered the temporary mayor of the city. Um, and uh, there's always been a pushback on that, at least from the mayor's office. And so there should probably be some discussion with that. Uh, and then whenever the city council by a vote of two thirds of the members serving declares that the temporary absence of the mayor uh, from the city or his, his or her inability to perform those duties need administrative leadership, uh, the council uh, can um, establish uh, uh, a council member to assume those obligations. 
Um, and it goes on about if the, if the acting mayor doesn't want to do it, then the council can designate someone else. Uh, are there any questions, council member? I just want to say that in the people I've talked to who are better at math than I am, they all say you can't have two thirds with the council makeup that we have. So we might want to look at that. Oh. See the three quarters or one half or whatever, but two thirds, we, we can't have a two thirds, I think, with eight council people. Excuse me, Mr. <laughs> Simon. And the yes, the math people the have told people. me that. With the current language, what is the role of the deputy mayor then? I agree, question. I mean, don't that's know. cost. Yeah. I mean, don't know. Eliminate that position. Same question. Commissioner Washington. The current charter does not call for a deputy mayor, and there's really no need for our city to have a deputy mayor. In fact, we shouldn't have a deputy mayor. And in my opinion, it was instituted to circumvent what is in the charter right here. So mm -hmm. that is definitely something we will have to look at. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Uh, next, 2.2-401. Two this, this talks about uh, recalls, how, how they go about uh, uh, pursuing a recall of any elective officer, and then initiatives and referendums. How, to, how to, can the people create an ordinance, uh, and uh, how can they uh, reject or approve an ordinance that has been enacted by city council? The 2.2-403 goes into uh, what those petitions are, uh, or what they look like in terms of both the initiative the initiative and referendum petitions, how they have to be put uh, together, the amount of uh, electors who must sign them, what goes into the petitions, the signatures that are required, the time that they are required to get the signatures. It just goes through the entire process. Uh, it's something that we'd want to take a look at just to make sure it makes sense uh, the way it is. But I, it does, uh, this does give, um, you know, when, when people come down and say, we want to have some involvement in our government and what can we do, this squarely puts this into their hands in terms of the ability uh, to create uh, ordinances and to uh, repeal uh, ordinances that were enacted by council. So the last word is with the people. Uh, and so that's something that we should probably come back and look at. Um, uh, 2-404, suspension of referred ordinances. This talks about uh, how a, a uh, ordinance that has been passed, if there is a petition uh, challenging that, that the ordinance uh, will be delayed or suspended until uh, that process has been concluded. Uh, ballot issues, um, 2-405, council action on petitions. Um, it, it, again, it refers to both the initiative petition, referendum pin, uh, petition, um, and it, it goes through the time uh, requirements um, uh, that must be filed and uh, goes through the process of how that is to, to be uh, carried out. Uh, 2.406 talks about special elections. Uh, these are uh, special elections that may be called by resolution of city council. They may be elections that are created to fill a vacancy. Uh, it goes through what the process is, the, the day re time requirements, uh, and um, some prohibitions on when the vacancy occurs, uh, when that election can be held uh, relative to a general election that may be coming up. Uh, I think this is going to have to be re uh, reviewed in light of all of the changes that have occurred with the uh, uh, Home Rule City Act, that these may have changed. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Uh, any questions on any of that stuff so far? Council? I would just like to concur that I, I think, I'm sorry, what's up? Would you do call me? Go ahead. I, I just would like to concur with what you said. I think anything in this charter related to elections needs to comply with state law. Yep. And there's been so many changes. So. I think I our, our, new, our new legal counsel, when we hire that person, <laughs> will be able to help us. Commissioner Cowie? The Home Rules Act, the Home Rules Act, and it could be the Constitution, it could be all the state election laws, everything. Um, then under 2.409, um, uh, it talks about appeal and, re uh, and reenactment of ordinances that have been uh, adopted through initiative proceedings, basically says if the 
uh, if an ordinance was approved through an initiative proceedings, the council for a period of two years after that date cannot change it. Also, if the ordinance was nullified through a referendum, again, it's a two-year period before city council can act on that. Uh, and then there's that big one, 2.410, charter revision question every 12 years. Might want to look at that. Yeah. And then this is the this is an interesting one, the charter amendment. Um, so the charter can be amended by a majority vote of the electors in a matter provided by statute. So again, that's that petition process that you would have to go through. So when, you know, if, if you ever wanted, and I think our charter has been amended, what, eight times since it was approved back 46 years ago or something like that. Um, so if someone in the, you know, in the public would want to go out and say, uh, gee, I'd like to, uh, you know, change the word system, at large system, deal with the charter doing that. It doesn't have to be done through the charter commission. Uh, there can always be a charter amendment uh, that could be uh, put out there uh, to to make those changes as well. So those, that's a quick review of uh, Article 2 of the city charter. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, that's it for our business portion. All right, next we'll move on to commissioner remarks. Uh, before we do, I would just like to note that the second public comment comes after this. So if you have not already filled out a blue sheet with Kashava and you would like to speak, please do so now. And we'll move on to commissioner remarks now. I would just like to remind the commission that I'm sorry. I, I, I just want to remind the commission that I won't be at the July 30th meeting. I've sent a note to you as chair. Thank you. You did. And I have it. Anyone else? Any other comments? Okay, hearing none. Let's move on to public comment. All right. So back to the second public comment. My first blue sheet is Linda Appling. What they say? Do you want to try speaking your mic again to see if Can you hear there? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Please continue. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. All right. What well, was my fault? <laughs> anyway, for the record, I will again state my name. It is Linda Appling. I live in the city of Lansing in Eaton County. Please remember Eaton County. I had the feeling that sometimes you guys totally forget we're over there in Eaton County. You sell parts of Lansing, I'll mention that again, and then you exclude us for many additional <laughs> input in terms of that. And right now, if I want to go to, what is it, the uh, zoo, I have to pay more money than somebody that lives in Ingham County, even though I did, in part, fund that zoo before they sold it. But the next issue that I'd like to bring up is the uh, <laughs> council members at large. I think you must remember to go very carefully here. Right now, with the four council members at, at large, I've got five people representing me. Five of them that I can go to in terms of having or addressing an issue. If you cut them out, then I've only got one in terms of that. So I'm in favor of keeping those individuals or those seats. I would also like to say that I've heard people indicate that perhaps you would have more minorities if you had more wards. No, that's not going to happen. Not the way that uh, Lansing's population is spread out. I would also point out that in terms of the uh, <clears throat> council members at large, there are two blacks, one Hispanic. So if you start messing with those numbers, you're going to eliminate 75% potentially of the individuals who are minorities. Yeah, I got my numbers right. I know <laughs> what we have there in terms of that. And that a lot of people may not look very favorably in terms of the potential reduction uh, 
of the number of minorities. That's it, I'm through. <clears throat> Thank you. Next we have Loretta Stanaway. I just want to encourage each one of you to recognize how important it is that you are here and what this job is and entails. And think about the fact that it was the public, the general blue collar, low income minority workers, the backbone of the city, the people that, who supports the city more than any other group of population in the city who advocated for this. It was not expected to pass. The mayor and all the others were shocked when it got on the ballot, and then they were shocked again when it got approved. Um, you have a population in this city who is very frustrated and very fed up and very sick and tired of having their money taken out of their pockets for things they don't want, need, or approve of, and manners that they don't want or need or approve of. So it's really this this charter revision is driven by the frustration of that populace so you need to do everything in your power to reach out to that group of people and hear what it is they're telling you and saying and wanting from you and if that means heaven forbid giving up a um, football ticket because you have season tickets um, then you give up that season ticket for that night and go to the meeting you have to put your priorities on this commission. I mean, if you've got a wedding or a funeral to go to, an out-of-state wedding, okay, that, that, that passes the muster. But virtually almost anything else does not. You need to look at your calendars. You need to revamp your calendars. You need to schedule things in and take other things out to make room for those that must come in. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have uh, Jacquez West. Good evening, Jay West, the current Churchill Down community president. So I'll try and keep it on point. So the um, section 2103, uh, eligibility of office, 20 years. I think that rule should be changed to match the state or maybe even reduce that amount. Um, reason being is um, I feel like we should work on maybe writing the law from a point of view of, of forgiveness, not just uh, setting the laws on people. Um, this right here, the dialogue that we have, we actually are experiencing democracy right here. We are speaking to the people that are making the laws and actually interacting with you guys to get the laws passed that we want. So I feel like in a, a democracy, we should remove or I guess reduce that requirement um, as, as a forgiveness thing. Um, The people that went to jail, they did their time. Um, they had the chains on them when they were in there. They were released, but there's still chains on there. There's mental chains. And I'm not speaking from personal experience, but I can say I've spoken to people that have gone through that, and the mental chains are the worst. I've seen for animals, we cage up animals. They walk in a circle. When they're released, they still walk in that circle because those chains are still there. Those mental chains are still there. So changing this law will re remove some of those mental chains on some of the citizens and maybe make us be viewed more as a, a forgiving city. Um, lastly, city council members appointment. Um, I do agree again with Linda Epling about the setup of the at-large um, members. The at-large members are there as a fail-safe backup or second or third voice. If you can't get a hold of the person in your area, um, you can go to one of the um, at-large members so you have other people to go to. If you're not able to get a hold of them, you can get a hold of the at-large member and say, hey, I'm not able to get a hold of so-and-so. Can you help me out? So it's a second place to go to to get help. I am in a good district. Adam Hussein, he always answers. So. Um, and Ms. Kamar Carter at-large as well as Trini, they, they do a great job. So um, I will uh, release my time. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Nicholas Zandi. So, 
This is again Nick Lazandi, the president of the Old Everett Neighborhood Association. I am again here to defend my stances on why I support increasing the number of wards and getting rid of at large. Again, Lansing is the only city in the state of Michigan that has half at large. All others either go all at large, which is an even worse way of representation. That's Kalamazoo. And others go with mostly wards. And that's a much better system because every part of the city gets equally represented. If you go half, if you go half at large, you're going to leave too much of a city either overrepresented or underrepresented. And because of that, it just leaves the city just completely inadequately represented. You've got the first war, which is currently way underrepresented on the city council. And as I think only one person on the city council is from the first ward, that is their council member, Ryan Cost. And aside from that, none of the at-large members are first ward council members. So that is a huge problem that I have. Second, I know a lot of people discussed how much should we increase it to. Well, and what would the increased number of wards look like? Well, I could probably show you this via email if you can provide your um, c city charter commission emails to me. Um, I could draw the wards in a certain way that what it would look like when you increase them, either to five wards, six wards, seven wards, eight wards, nine wards, ten wards. I would be going higher, but I don't think it's right to increase it higher than 10. I think that 10 is probably the highest it should go. But in saying that, uh, we should not be doing this half at large because, again, it's going to leave so much of this city unrepresented, and the first ward effectively is the one that gets it the worst. And, again, previously, the fourth ward, specifically, again, that area around Moore's River Drive, uh, has gotten so much of a representation. And then recently, we the South Side sort of enacted its revenge, and now the second ward has so much of a representation. we got to balance this out so that no part of the Lansing gets overrepresented and no part of the Lansing gets underrepresented, and everyone is equally represented. That's all I'm going to say, and I shall yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next, I have Donald Dean. Don Dean, uh, North Side Ward One. Um, while uh, Ryan Ryan is is a fantastic councilman, and he does he, I mean, he always get in contact with him, but he's one person. And for the, uh, since before Brian was on council, I've emailed the, the the council, and I can count probably on one hand when I got a response back from an at-large member. Okay, so yeah, and I, all of us in the room are that, that are Lansing residents are all represented by five council members. But when you send an email or whatever, because you may maybe not come, you know, correspondence, and you get you get two responses: one from another ward representative, and and then one from your councilman. But you don't get a, get anything from the at large council members. What's the point? They, they might not as, they might as well not even be there. So that's why I'm advocating for, for um, specific board council members. Maybe, maybe, maybe we make it, maybe make an odd number and not reduce the number because then you're, you're having, gonna have less representation. So I heard someone float over, float out seven. I think a seven, seven is too small. Let's go. Let's go with nine. Let's have seven ward, have seven wards and two at large. That way, that way we still we have three people representing us rather 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 than rather than uh, five. But then you you still have, you have you still have more representation that spread out across the city. Um, second of all, uh, as far as like the city attorney, 
I think that the city attorney not, not, not necessarily should be elected, but should be accountable not only to the mayor, but also equally accountable to the, to the city council. So because we, we have seen where, where, the, where the city attorney kowtows to the mayor because he is, they, they are directly, respond, uh, directly in line with the mayor. And the mayor says, you do this or else you're out your, your job. So then, then the city council can't say anything, can't say boo about it. So, so who who is who is the city attorney gonna gonna uh, listen to more often than because law and being a lawyer and being an attorney is all about debate. It's all about interpretation of the law. So, so therefore, the the attorney the, the city attorney is gonna look at what's most favorable for the mayor, not for the city, not for the council, but for the mayor. Thank you. Uh, the last blue sheet that I have at this time is Michael Lynn. Well, y'all been laying me up softballs today talking about the mayor and the city attorney. I'm not going to do it. I'm a changed man. Uh, but I want to talk about your guys' conversation around getting the word out. Um, we got the word out really good. That's why y'all are sitting here. Uh, so when I say that, I say that flyers are one thing. I don't think they're all that effective. Again, I live in an apartment building with about 130 buildings. And every time y'all send a flyer, I see 130 of them in the trash right there by the mail. Um, but getting to credible messengers in neighborhoods where you want the information to go uh, is what I think is more important. And City Paul saying a credible messenger in Lansing, I'll just tell y'all that flat out. They're, um, as far as the black and brown community, black community specifically, they're harmful. We've been saying that forever. The fact that the city even continues to use them is disrespectful uh, from everything that's happened. I mean, Sarah Anthony picketed outside of their building. I don't know why we even still had them in a conversation. So just so you know, uh, I'd be really upset to see that happen. Um, but anyways, outside of that fact, getting to credible messengers in neighborhoods where y'all want the information uh, is really important. So I, I think everybody here is pretty much from a space in the city. You know some people that may be a, a part of your influential circle. Uh, getting to them, uh, word of mouth, one person to one person is really how we did it. We showed up in the community meetings and talked about this till we were blue in the face. We, uh, again, tried to uh, quantify why this was so important compared to taking on singular fights. Uh, why this was more important and it was just it was tactical how we had to do it being that it was only a couple people speaking on it at the time um and we got it done ultimately uh and being sued helped that that really brought the word out um so if y'all could find somebody to sue i'm not gonna help y'all with that but that will get the word out for y'all as well uh, but a flyer i think is one thing but i think it's not it can't be the, the end all so find some credible messages if y'all need help with that reach out to us man we're community members we're y'all y'all are us we are one let us help y'all get that information. But I secondary to that, because um, it's one thing to bring informed people. I think I don't know who spoke on that, but uh, there's a lot of people who went through a lot. The reason why this is open, there's a lot of people who understand what's happened up to this point. Uh, it's important for you guys not just to reach out to folks who are going to show up and have their opinions on things that may not. They, it could be a waste of time, some of it. And I'm not saying it is, but at the end of the day, if they don't know a whole lot about what the charter is, education was lapsed. We didn't have a whole lot of that. So you're going to have to educate yourself on what's happening in this city. Ultimately, I think that's the most powerful tool you guys have. And do not let the city tell you that you can't figure out, you can't open up cases and all of these different situations that have happened. And why did we get to this point that somebody had to sue us? What happened? Where did the charter fail us? Where did these boards and commissions fail us? Because that's something that I've recognized throughout this process. And somebody spoke about the boards being empowered. If those boards had been empowered prior to me having the situations I had, I probably wouldn't have had to sue you all. And we wouldn't be where we are with that in that case. So look at those cases and what happened and took place in those. That's where you're going to get a lot of information about how this charter might need to change. Um, so anyways, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Omar. Hey, so first, is this on? Yeah, okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is appointments to city boards. The current structure that we have right now, you got to go through the mayor and then the city council. I think we have that backwards. Um, that's why when you look at the city boards and people who serve on those boards, they've been there for 25 years, 30 years. And we wonder why we're not seeing any changes. 
And so that's something that we should be looking at. I think if somebody is interested in a position and they apply, they should go to council, let those eight people decide who's, who's the most qualified person that should be on these boards so that we can actually see real changes uh, in the city. Another thing, um, at large versus wards. I want, listen, we all have different opinions, but we need to, we need to set the record straight. We're not eliminating the at large positions. We are replacing it with more wards. So it's not, we're not going from eight total to just four now, all right? I heard somebody say, you know, at large members are backup. That's not, that's not how this city charter uh, is structured. They're not the backup, all right? If I reach out to Tamara Trini, they're just as powerful as Ryan Cost. So I think it wouldn't hurt to have uh, more wards uh, because a lot of times, just like every person has said, they reach out to their war member first. Why is that? Ask yourself, why is that? I live in the first ward. Why would I reach out to Ryan instead of um, Tamar, uh, Ms. Carter or uh, Ms. You know, Trini? Why is that? Because they don't live in my ward, so I don't feel like they owe me anything, right? They still serve on the city council, still have the same say, same power, same vote, but yet there's a disconnect. And so we want people who are gonna live in our ward to represent us. That's all, thank you. Thank you. At this time, I have no more blue sheets. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at this time? Yeah. Wait, can we let, are we done? Have you no other business? I'm not going to. My issue this time goes to the issue of the use of Facebook and websites. In terms of that, I'm extremely worried uh, about such media. And the reason I'm worried, I've heard a couple of you mention it up here. And when you go and look at that, I, I, I don't use it personally. I think it's one of the worst inventions that have ever been done. And. It's, it's not something that I use. People could lie on it and everything else <laughs> if you look at it. But what I'm worried about is if you're using that to measure something, do you know that the people that are on that website are from the city of Lansing? Are they taxpayers here? Do they live in this city? Before you quote anything that they have or that they say or take their recommendations, I definitely think that that needs to be done. There needs to be some verification. And I'm very worried about what I perceive as perhaps the lack of verification in terms of social media. Thank you. Thank you. Have you, have you no other business before council? We're adjourned. from Krista Quinn from our development team. Styrofoam, ugh, styrofoam. How can we recycle it? I know it's not allowed in our bins, but I hate throwing it away. Again, Brian.